Our next speaker's name is Philippe de Reich. Definitely a guy you're going to like. If authentication is something that you want to perfect, you're going to love Open ID Connect. All right, thank you for the wonderful introduction and good morning still. It's still morning, so good morning, everyone here. I'm standing between you and lunch, I understand, so uh, <laughs> let's talk about authentication. When we talk about authentication, people often, well, we, we initially think about a login form, right? If you do authentication on web applications, you're dealing with login forms. That's unfortunately, maybe unfortunately, the way things are, but it's how things work today. Seems very simple. You have an input field for a username, you have an input field for a password, and a button. How hard can that be, right? Well, if you look at that under the hood, there's a lot going on that you might want to take into account. There's user management, of course. You'll have a user database somewhere with passwords and all of that. You'll have permissions and maybe roles or whatever associated with those users. But there's also a lot of security features you need to take into account. There's brute force attacks. An attacker can go to the login form and try to Guess the password of a user. If I know that the user exists, I can just try passwords over and over again. You should probably detect and prevent that from happening. Even the more dangerous are credential stuffing attacks. In credential stuffing attacks, I'm not trying to guess like an idiot what the password might be. No, I'm going to use an existing username password combination. I'm going to break in to a forum somewhere with less good security than your enterprise application. I'm going to steal the usernames and passwords, and I'm going to try out the email address and well, the email addresses and the password combinations on another application. And if that works, I can now log in as one of these users. And this actually works a lot in practice, because users are not very good at handling passwords. I, I want to do a quick question around in the room here. Like, who here reuses a password on different websites? Show of hands. Let's, let's be honest here. Like, everyone, right? A few people did not raise their hands. I probably thinking they're lying. <laughs> if not, respect. If you never reuse a single password, that's a really good job. But in practice, it doesn't happen. In practice, we all reuse passwords, me included. Not everywhere I use a password manager, but sometimes I do reuse a password. And that is a real problem behind credential stuffing. And that's one of the most recent dangerous attacks. We see this a lot. There's a story about Disney+, Plus, which was released two weeks ago. And within a day, people were hacking accounts on Disney+, Plus, not because they were compromised, because people reused passwords that were stolen before. There's billions of accounts out there just floating around, and people abuse that for credential stuffing. So keep that in mind, it's a really dangerous attack. So security is one thing, and then the technicalities, like supporting password managers might be tricky, and handling mobile logins where users have like a, uh, limited input capabilities and you have to show the password becomes a bit more difficult. And then multi-factor authentication, as good as these mechanisms are, they're not very fun to implement. It's, it takes some effort to make things like a security key or something like that work in practice. And all of that is effort that developers have to invest in authentication. And if you want to integrate social login, like Google or Facebook or Twitter or GitHub login, again, it's going to be effort on your end on how to add that to your application. And all of that in my opinion, makes authentication today a nightmare. Implementing authentication today, custom authentication mechanisms, is something I never recommend to people. A new application should not start by implementing login, absolutely not. Instead, you should be delegating that to an identity provider. Delegate that to a service dedicated to handling authentication, because that service will handle all the crap for you. Push it there, and you don't have to do anything. And that's going to be the main topic here, because OpenID Connect allows you to do that. OpenID Connect is a de facto standard today to delegate authentication to someone else. Who that someone else is can be different instances. We'll talk about that in a second. And that is what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to explain to you what the concept of OIDC is, how to use that, a few recent changes in the protocols. I'm going to even show you some code examples later on. The first thing I want to do is I want to conceptualize OpenID Connect. I want to help you walk through what it means for a user to implement or to use OpenID Connect. I'm going to use Netlify as an example. Netlify is a static site deployment tool, amongst other things. I use it to deploy websites, and it's actually really, really awesome at doing that. And you can log in to Netlify with GitHub. So let's take a look at what that means. Behind the scenes, it's going to use OpenID Connect. To be fair, if you know what OpenID Connect does, this is not an accurate representation, it's a conceptual representation. We'll talk about the accurate details later on in a lot of detail. So Netlify 
on the bottom and me as a user on top. So what do we want to do? We want to do authentication. We want to ensure that we can log in. So essentially, we're going to do that with GitHub. And since services need to talk to each other with the user involved, it's going to be with a browser. There's no way around that. It's going to ha happen through a browser. Chrome or whatever uh, is your favorite browser um, at the moment. So what's going to happen is when I click on the button, log in with GitHub, Netlify is going to send a redirect through my browser to GitHub. It's going to take me as a user to GitHub, where I'm asked to authenticate. GitHub is going to be like, who the hell are you? Like, oh yeah, I'm Philippe, don't, don't you know? Here's my username and password. So that's essentially on GitHub. GitHub is now saying like, hey, you need to log in because Netlify is trying to um, use GitHub for you to authenticate. And that's what this message here means. So I'm going to log in with my username and password. Philippe at pragmaticwebsview.com. That's my GitHub username, not a Netlify username, GitHub username, and my GitHub password, FluffyDog19. Not my really real password, by the way. Don't, don't try it. Even if you try it, I have multi-factor authentication enabled, so uh, you'll have to find and steal my uh, security key as well. So it doesn't work like that. But this is GitHub authentication. It should be secure, very important. And when that's done, GitHub now knows who I am. I authenticated to GitHub, so GitHub is going to relay that information to Netlify, again, through my browser. So it's going to take a URL with some crap in there. We'll talk about the crap later. But essentially, it's going to send a redirect back to Netlify. And that is OpenID Connect, somewhat. And with that information, Netlify can look at that and see like, oh, so GitHub says that you're Philippe. Awesome. And Netlify is going to do this. It's going to show you like Philippe Direct's team, and it's going to take my picture from GitHub in the top right corner and show that there. I have not entered any information in Netlify. I just logged in with GitHub. But the information that GitHub relayed to Netlify contains my name, and my email address, and my picture, and some other stuff as well. We'll talk about that later. And that's essentially how you conceptualize that. That's how you um, use OpenID Connect to authenticate with a third-party identity provider. To be fair, and this is something that I recently learned that confuses many people, the green parts are OpenID Connect. The top part is really not OpenID Connect. So OpenID Connect is not about the authentication. It's about the, delegate, the delegation of authentication. OpenID Connect allows you to use an identity provider for authentication, but doesn't specify how the user actually authenticates. That part is not in the OIDC spec. The spec is there like, whatever. Whatever works for you, just go ahead. We don't really care as long as you authenticate the user, and that's it. And then relay, relay information about that authentication back to the requesting party. And that is a very important distinction. So this top flow, step three and four, is GitHub in this case, can be anything else, and GitHub is free to decide how they want to authenticate you. In many uh, scenarios, you don't even have to authenticate if you are already authenticated. If you use GitHub quite a bit, then you'll have an existing session with GitHub. GitHub will know that I'm Philippe, so it doesn't ask, like, who are you? It's, it's knows like, oh, you're Philippe, so do you want to log in with Netlify? Like, yeah, I actually want to. All right, there we go. Very important distinction. All right. The social login scenario, we all know that, like login with Google and GitHub, and especially if you have like three or four, it's very fun because you never remember which one you use, so it, it's going to be a nightmare. But OpenID Connect, that's a visible use case. The invisible use case or the less visible use case is private use or enterprise use. Here's one of my training applications. So I do a lot of training, and I use Restorgrade as an example. It's a restaurant review application. And when I built that, I was like, I don't want to implement authentication. So why not offload that to an identity provider? Of course, if you want to write a restaurant review, it doesn't make much sense to log in with GitHub, right? It's like, what, what the hell? Plus, most of the users probably won't even have GitHub or know what it is. So that doesn't work very well. Facebook might work, but we're not a big fan of that. So let's just set up our own user database. Let's set up our own identity provider. So what I did for Restorgrade, or what we did in a, a workshop yesterday, for example, is we used Out0 as an identity provider. It's a cloud-based identity provider, but basically what we do there is we set up our own identity provider. It's not GitHub, it's our own thing. We control that, but somebody else is running that for us. Somebody else is maintaining that. Somebody else handles password storage and user storage and multi-factor authentication if you want to and all of that. So we offload that to an identity provider. And that's what many of you, I guess, are using in your applications as well, or as a user or as a developer, it depends on what you're doing there. But essentially, the same flow happens when we go back here. We're now authenticated. We can start writing reviews and all of that. And if you conceptualize that with the slide with the images, it's the same flow. It's the same thing happening. It's the same redirection patterns. It's just that these two parties here, these two trusts are, are controlled by the same entity. 
they al already trusted each other in the previous scenario, but now they're actually run by the same entity. And whether that's on-premise or cloud-based or whatever you're doing doesn't matter. It's yours. Whether it's your Microsoft Active Directory with OpenID Connect or whether you're running something custom yourself or Keycloak locally in your, uh, in your organization, doesn't matter. It's an identity provider and that's what matters. And OpenID Connect enables this kind of behavior. And that brings us to takeaway number one. You should delegate authentication to an identity provider with OpenID Connect. That's essentially the current best practice today because that identity provider is going to be good or should be good at handling authentication. It should take care of all of the technical details and is cap capable to implement protections against brute force attacks and credential stuffing and all of that. Offload. Even if it's only if you're building feel like uh, the, the sponsor before, they have 130 consultants building stuff. I can imagine that it makes sense for, to have one team building or maintaining an identity provider and everybody else using that. You don't want to keep re-implementing authentication over and over and over again. Do it one time centrally and use that for your applications. All right. Most of you are developers, right? You want to get into more detail, so let's do that. Let's talk about how this happens in practice. There's two main scenarios to consider. A first scenario is the one we actually don't want to acknowledge but still exists, is a backend application. Like a, a backend, used to be the monolithic backend spitting out HTML pages, but today it's kind of a monolith with an Angular front end, but you still have the traditional setup of pages and a backend with a session and something like that. And I know we don't like it, and I still, I also realize that many people use it. I often encounter this with customers when I'm consulting with them. They actually um, try to move away from this towards a microservice architecture, but they still have the old system with sessions and all of that in place. But even in such a system, you can use OpenID Connect to offload authentication. That's what this means in practice. So in this case, the backend application is going to be the driver. The backend application is going to start the whole process by going through the browser of the user to the identity provider. It's a redirect again. I'm going to show you that in a lot of detail in a couple of minutes, so don't worry. This is where the user authenticates. Basically, the user authenticates with the identity provider, whether it's your own or GitHub or Google. doesn't matter much. When the user is done, the backend, in this case, is going to receive true re redirects. It's going to receive a code, an authorization code. This is a detail that we'll flesh out later as well. And with that authorization code, the backend can go to the identity provider and ask that provider, what the hell does this mean? that code, because the code itself is meaningless, and it's going to obtain an identity token with that code. And that identity token is a result of an OIDC flow and tells the backend, like this is the user, username, email, and a unique identifier. And with that unique identifier, the backend can link this particular user to an internal user concept, like, oh, this GitHub user ID is actually this user in my database with this and this properties and these reviews, and now I know who authenticated, and now I can establish that authenticated session and act as I did before. That's use case number one. All right. Use case number two is what we all aspire to build, like a front-end only, but no back-end, just APIs in the back-end and no front-end. In that case, your front end, there's no stateful back end, so your front end is going to drive the authentication procedure. So again, the client is going to redirect to the identity provider. Well, redirecting from Angular is just navigating the window to the identity provider, but it's somewhat of a redirect nonetheless. And the user is going to authenticate. And then, of course, when the user is authenticated, the client is going to get that code in return, and the client is going to exchange that code with the identity provider. It's basically the same flow as before, a few minor differences, we'll talk about them later, but essentially that's what we're doing here and we're getting that identity token in return. And now we know who the, who the user is. Now we know like, oh, this is Philippe de Rijk. And now you authenticate it to a front end. Yeah. Authentication to a front end means nothing, right? The front end can't do anything with your username and your user ID. It's like, what the hell is this? The only thing it can do is like, welcome, Philippe. And then it's like, yeah. I have no data, I have nothing to link this to, so what the hell do I do with that? So OIDC with a front that only makes no sense. Unless you have locally stored data in a browser or something, maybe, sure. But in reality, it makes no sense. That's why OIDC for front ends is not used in isolation. It's typically used in combination with OAuth. So what we're going to do is we're not only going to get an identity token, we're also going to get an access token. And with that access token, we can access APIs on behalf of the user. 
If this would be a use case with the GitHub as the identity provider, we would get an, ad an access token allowing us to access GitHub's APIs in the name of the user. So this client could access GitHub in my name, get a list of my repos, and do some whatever it offers as features on my repos. And that is makes a lot more sense in the front-end world. This seems very confusing because OIDC is actually built on top of OAuth. We already were using OAuth when we were using OIDC. We just use one additional feature allowing us to get an access token as well so that the front end can access APIs on behalf of the user. So OID OAuth and OIDC, when they connect, are very closely related. Always something to keep in mind. And the same thing goes for our backend scenario on the left, by the way. On the left, we can also access APIs on behalf of the user. So nothing prevents us from also getting an access token there, allowing that backend to start accessing APIs. That's what Net Netlify, Netlify does. Because guess what? Netlify doesn't have any data. No, they go to GitHub. I linked them to my GitHub account. They go there, they pull in a repo, put that um, code, that HTML there, and show it online in the website. If you grab the slides of this talk, they're available on my website. I just deployed them like 20 minutes ago with Netlify, just like that. And that is how these things fit together and how you can actually start building useful things with OIDC and OAuth in combination. Note that on the left, this step here at the bottom is not necessary. So one of my applications is actually a backend application that doesn't call any external APIs on behalf of the user. There you can use OIDC in isolation. There it makes a lot of sense to just do authentication. In a front-end only world, it doesn't make much sense because you need APIs to do something useful as well. All right. Everybody good? All right. Let's talk about the dirty details of this. How does this work in practice? Because High-level schematics are fine unless, until you have to implement it and it's like, yeah, what the hell do we do now? Well, let me show you. Let's take this scenario again, Netlify backend system trying to get access to GitHub. Here's how you do that in practice. We had to redirect, the sign in with GitHub, going to GitHub. Very easy, like just go to GitHub. In practice, the URL to go there looks like this. These are the details from OIDC and OAuth. Welcome to the fun. <laughs> Essentially. What you have here is a couple of interesting things, such as the response type indicates what type of flow you're running, what you expect as a response. In this case, an ID token means I expect an identity token. I'm basically running an open ID connect flow, and I expect information about the user's authentication. And the code part means I also expect an authorization code so I can get some access tokens later on to access APIs as well. That's what we're basically doing here. The scope indicates what we expect as information. The scope right here says we expect the user's identifier, his email address, and his profile information, which is going to be my GitHub picture and stuff like that. If you choose to share that on GitHub, that is. All right. That's step one and two. Then GitHub is going to do its authentication magic. GitHub is going to um, ask me to authenticate, check my credentials, um, ask me for approval the first time. So the first time, GitHub is going to be like, hold on. Do you really want to share this personal information with Netlify? And I can decide, like, no, not really. Cancel. Or I can say, like, yeah, sure, that's totally fine, and I can move ahead with this. That's basically what looks like this. So the authentication dialog and the consent dialog, um, you've seen that in practice quite often. All right. Then GitHub has to send the flow back to Netlify. Again, it's going to do that with a redirect. So the redirect in 7 and 8 takes us back to Netlify, and the URL looks like this. So the URL is basically a callback to Netlify with the identity token as a parameter and the code as a parameter as well. That identity token contains the user's information. That's what Netlify is going to use to perform authentication. It says like Philip de picture is this, and, and that and that. And so Netlify can now instantiate the UI. Like, hey, welcome, Philip. And that's it. All right, this is OIDC. Straight up OIDC. Oh, sorry, here's the identity token that you actually get. Uh, I have some details here. So um, you can see my name is in there, and this SUB is my unique user identifier at GitHub. It's a fictional one, so don't worry about that. But this is essentially my user ID at GitHub, and this will never change from my account. I can change my name, I can change my email address, but this identifier will always be the same. So Netlify will always be able to link this to my Netlify account. And I cannot try to get access to your account because it doesn't work like that. This token is protected. It's a JOT, JSON Web Token, and it's signed, so it cannot be modified by a malicious user. All right. Again, the information so you have something to refer back to later. And this is OIDC. So now we're authenticated at Netlify. So if Netlify only wants to do authentication, this is where the flow would end. Like, yeah, this is good enough for us. 
We know who the user is, we can allow them to do whatever they want, but in reality, they also want access to your GitHub repos. So what they can do is, they can use OAuth in this case to exchange that code for an access token and a refresh token, and they can use those tokens to access the GitHub APIs and to do whatever they want to do. That's OAuth. I'm not going to talk about the details of OAuth here. That would take us way too far, and you'll get pissed because you're hungry. So let's not do that. I did talk about that yesterday for a full day. If you have any questions, I'll be here the rest of the day as well. So don't hesitate to ask me during one of those moments. All right. That was the backend scenario. Netlify, backend system, backend systems, we call them secure environments because you can store, kind of store secrets there and stuff like that. Very important in step nine, I didn't mention that yet, but in step nine, the client, Netlify here, authenticates to GitHub. Like, hey, I'm Netlify. Remember I set this up before and you gave me a secret, like a client password? Here's that secret to prove that it's really me. And that is an important step to prevent abuse of this authorization code. Now let's move to the front end. You see where this is going, right? Our front end's a good place to store secrets. Like in a JavaScript file, secret is this string. And then you build and deploy it. That's awesome, right? No. <laughs> if you're thinking like, yeah, maybe, no. Seriously, no. <laughs> Same thing for mobile apps, by the way. Do never ever store secrets in a mobile application because e people can easily take it out. It's front end code, it's not secure code. Everybody can inspect that. Even if you try to hide it, it's going to be really, really hard to hide it. So you cannot store a secret in a front end. So if you want to do this with Angular, you cannot authenticate in step seven here, which is kind of a problem, especially on mobile, but also uh, a bit on web applications. But there's a solution for that. And the solution for that is called PIXI. P-K-C-E, Proof Key for Code Exchange. The OAuth and OIDC spec people, they like complicated names. In reality, Pixie is kind of a one-time password for the client. So what the client is going to do, it's going to generate a secret and then prove that it possesses that secret in step two. I'm skipping over a lot of details here. Um, and it's going to prove that it actually had that secret in the beginning in step nine. What it does, in a nutshell, what Pixie does, it proves in step nine that this is the same client that is step two. That's all it does. So even if somebody managed to steal this authorization code, they don't have the secret that you provide in step nine, which makes abuse hard or impossible. And on mobile applications, this is mandatory. On mobile, you must use Pixie. No questions about it. On web applications, it is the current best practice to use it there as well. Previously, you would use the implicit flow for web applications. That thing has been deprecated since the beginning of this year, and you're recommended to use Pixie because it's better. It's cleaner. Implicit is not broken, but Pixie is cleaner. So if you want to know more details, again, come talk to me later, because seriously, uh, there's a lot going on here that's um, on how this works in practice. But what you need to remember is the flows are both the same. Backends use client authentication, frontends use Pixie. That's the main lesson here. Remember that. All right. I see some people getting anxious, like enough PowerPoint arrows, like, come on, how do we do that? How do you write code? Well, don't worry, I have code examples. There's this library from Manfred Steyer, who's here. So if you want to know more about that, talk to him. And this is how you do that. <coughs> awesome, right? As a developer, this should make you very happy. Remember this very crazy URL with 15 different parameters? Gone. Why? Because the library handles that for you. You need to configure the library. So I, honestly, I left out like five lines of code of configuration, like assigning things to variables literally copy-pasting that from your identity provider into your configuration file, and then you call this library and you're done. The library handles all the dirty details, and this is absolutely beautiful, because the library is going to make sure that I don't have to talk about you have to set a state here and a nonce here, and it means this, and this is how you generate a code uh, verifier and a challenge. Don't worry about that. The library is going to do all of that for you. You need to pick the right flow, and you're good to go. That's essentially it. I see some people like, yeah, I don't like Manfred. I don't want to use this library. <laughs> I don't know why, because he's really cool, but I, I can see that. So let's, let's say, let, let's roll with that. Like, let's not use Manfred's library. Well, Out0 has one for their own services called the Out0 SPA.js. We used that in the workshop yesterday. And this is the code. Clean, right? They even have uh, observables, so you subscribe to that. And when it fires, boom, you run the flow, and the library will handle everything for you. 
You don't even have to specify which flow because the library is for single page applications and they follow the current best practice of using Pixie. They know they support it, it's their library, it's a match made in heaven basically for Auth0 and it works like a charm. People implemented OAuth support yesterday in an Angular application and it was literally, I don't remember the exact number, so not literally, but like maybe 100 lines of code that you copy pasted from the documentation of Auth0. That's it. One file, done. Everything happens automatically. And even if you don't like Out0, like it's commercial, we want to do open source stuff, sure, why not? Keycloak is an open source identity provider. You can run that in your own organization. Many organizations are doing that. And they have a JavaScript adapter, which you call like this. So again, all of this complexity is hidden in these adapters. And they will resolve the tokens. They will exchange that code for tokens. They will store them in your application. They will even attach them to outgoing requests. And they handle everything for you. Absolutely beautiful. Rely on those libraries. That's the takeaway right here. Use OIDC, use the right flow, and rely on libraries to hide all the complexity. You don't need to know about these complex items anymore, which is absolutely good, because it helps you implement these things in a secure way. Because before, people would forget about a few details causing vulnerabilities, and that is no longer an issue if you use these libraries. Remember that we use the hybrid flow for most cases. There are some other flows which are very similar. So if you understand this, you'll also understand the other flows. Um, clients, backends use client authentication. Frontends use Pixie. Mobile and web frontends both use Pixie. All right. There's a few advanced scenarios, which I'm not going to talk about in much detail, but something you should know. OIDC is a lot more than authentication. People often think like, oh yeah, OpenID Connect, that's authentication. But they also support session management. They have a spec that defines how your application can check with the identity provider if the session is still active, yes or no. Something might, that might be very useful. They have logout specs. How do you do centralized logout? How can you log out from an identity provider and cause that logout to propagate to all the clients? There's two ways to do that, front channel and back channel logout. So OIDC is not only about authentication, it's about the whole user authentication lifecycle, including session management, whether you like it or not, there's going to be a session somewhere, uh, and logout and all of these things. So be aware that there's a lot more going on than authentication alone. Then the final topic is identity brokering. And that's actually really cool. OIDC doesn't stop at one hop. You can chain identity providers together. For example, GitHub could be like, you know what? Let's allow people to log in with Google or Facebook or your on-premise Active Directory. And that's called identity brokering. So on GitHub, if you go from Netlify to GitHub, GitHub could show you a button, log in with Google. And you could click that button, you would go to Google. And Google could show you a button, log in with Facebook. They're not going to do that. But they could. <laughs> they could. And as a user, you don't have to care about that. And that's how you can integrate social login. So if you use Out0, for example, they enable sign-in with Google by default, which is already two hops and might be very useful for some people. Identity brokering is even more useful in an enterprise setup. Because in an enterprise setup, you typically have different identity providers are different sets of users, and you want to keep them separate. You don't want to have one identity provider with users and employees and all of that together. So instead, you might want to have different identity providers and different applications as well. So this is a public application using the users here. This is a private, a bunch of private clients using the employee identity provider. And these are separate. But if I, as an employee, also want to use the public application or one of the less privileged applications using a different identity provider, I would have to use two to user accounts, which is not always what you want. So identity brokering here can be used to allow me as an employee to log in through the user identity provider with my employee account. And it's going to broker that identity. It's going to take the identity from here and propagate it through here to the Angular application. So now the Angular application will be like, oh, hi, Philippe, even though I only, only have one user account. And identity brokering in these scenarios is, is kind of useful for scenarios where you want to gain control, where you don't want to start removing accounts in five different identity providers. If you want to do that in one place only, then brokering makes a lot of sense. If you want to allow admin users to have their own identity provider and they need to log in to other applications, this is a good way to do that without having 15 different accounts. It's just as an idea to put in your head that OpenID Connect is actually a lot more and has very interesting use cases there as well. So to wrap this up, OpenID Connect is more than authentication alone. OIDC is the whole life cycle. 
And there's even unexplored aspects. They're still actively developing new features for OpenID Connect. So it's constantly moving. And you need, if you're using that, you need to stay up to date on those things as well. So identity brokering is very interesting, especially for social login. If you want to easily add login with Google, you can do that by adding a connector in your identity provider. But you can also do the same with your own internal identity providers. You could federate from one to the other, to the other and the other and the other if you want to. All right. If you have any questions, again, I'll be here the rest of the day, so don't hesitate to ask them. Can be questions about OIDC, OAuth, or security in general. I'll be happy to answer them. Follow me on Twitter. The slides are available on Twitter, so you can grab them from there. Even if you don't have a Twitter account, it's public, so you can just go there and grab it. And uh, I'd appreciate if you follow me as well, because I do tweet about security-relevant items there as well. All right. Thanks for being here, and talk to you later.